Vítajte pri počúvaní podcastu Ines. Všetky naše ďalšie podcasty si môžete vypočuť na stránke ines.sk lomitko audio. Prajeme vám príjemné počúvanie. Dnešná epizóda je záznam prednášky doktora Shona Geba, riaditeľa britskej Libertarian Alliance. Témou jeho verejnej prednášky, ktorú dňa 12. augusta 2015 zorganizoval Inés, bolo štátne špehovanie. Thank you Richard for a very flattering introduction. Um, I am always very pleased and honored to be invited in the summer to speak to an event organized by Inés, which is a most remarkable organization. And uh, today I am most honored that so many people have come out to hear what I have to say. It, it is rather a warm summer in Central Europe and I, I'm sure you will forgive me for not having come here today wearing a suit. <laughs> But, uh, yes. I am very conscious, however, of the fact that I'm speaking in the Progress Bar and that there will assuredly be people here this afternoon who know more about the subject on which I am to speak than I know myself. And so what I hope to do this afternoon is to set out what I think is the case, not to tell you as if we were in church and I were the priest telling you, not, not to tell you what is the truth, but to say what I think is the case, uh, and then to let those people who know more about the subject than I do uh, educate me. This is not so much a lecture as a dialogue. These words being said, I will begin. Ladies and gentlemen, At the moment, the British state, which is the state authority I know best, along with many other states, the American, the Australian, and I believe the French state, wants to be able to store much more of our information than has so far been the case. To be specific, the British government wants to be able to access our telephone records, our email records, that is the details of to whom we send and from whom we receive emails, our text messages, our web browsing history, and our online purchases using credit cards. It wants all of this information to be openly available to the authorities and it wants the various commercial organizations that provide us with electronic services to retain this data and to make it available on demand, not perhaps with a court order, but on demand to the law enforcement authorities. <coughs> The alleged justification for these claimed powers is the need to protect us from terrorists, from paedophiles, from criminals of every variety. We are told that we are living in what is fundamentally a new kind of society in which more and more of our lives take place online and therefore if the state is to continue protecting us with the same degree of professional competence that it has always in the past shown then it is necessary for the state to have access to these electronic records And if you continue protesting, if you say, no, I, I don't want to give my details, I, I don't want the authority to know what I'm buying online, I, I don't want my browsing history to be accessed by the police, I am worried 
about the use of this information, you are assured that the information will only be used for stated purposes. You are, you are assured that the information will be kept absolutely confidential and nobody else but the authorities will ever have access to this. And if you continue protesting, you'll be told that if you have nothing to hide, you, you surely have nothing to fear. I, I will try to deal with these claims one by one, but uh, w what I would say at this point is that the British state and many other Western states, maybe your own state, is asking for a police state. Uh, as simple as that. These are the building blocks of an electronic police state. Now, in my own country, England, when I, when I talk about high-tech police states, people often roll their eyes and say that I am an alarmist. My answer is that a police state is not necessarily... A, a police state does not necessarily show itself by having large numbers of men in black uniforms running around. A, a police state does not need to drag people into police cells to beat them to death or, or to burn holes in them with cigarettes. A, a police state does not even need concentration camps or labour camps. All of these things may be found useful now and again by a police state, but a police state does not necessarily show itself by these signs. That the purpose of a police state is to shut down debate over what the government does. It, it, it is to free the government from any degree of accountability and any restraints on how it conducts itself. Now, if empowering the state in this way requires concentration camps, then concentration camps may be built. If it requires uh, many men in black uniforms running about, then there will be men in black uniforms running about. But as I said, a police state is not defined by these uh, signs. And on the whole, modern politicians would rather not preside over the same kind of police state as we know from the history books. They don't, nobody has open ambitions to be another Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or, or even another Clement Gottwald. And so... When I, talk, when I talk about police state nowadays, I'm talking about a much gentler, a much softer, a, 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 much, a much more invisible thing than you ever had in the past. And modern information technology makes a police state much easier than it has ever been. The point is that to be watched is to be controlled. It's as simple as that. Th there is, for example, no law in my country that stops me from drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. There is no law that stops me from smoking 200 cigarettes a week. There is no law that stops you from becoming a radical Muslim. Th there is no law that stops me from joining the British National Party, which... Um, is not terribly friendly to Muslims. There is no law in my country to stop, from, to stop me from doing a whole range of things. However, if I know that I'm being watched, I may decide not to do any of these things. <coughs> Let me talk about smoking and drinking. The British National Health Service is a universal health care provider. It will treat you for any condition that you are suffering from if you present yourself to a doctor. The National Health Service is short of money, as you might expect, and the authorities are looking for ways to reduce the cost of the National Health Service budget. One proposal 
is that people who is that smokers who contract lung cancer should not receive the same standard of care as non-smokers who contract lung cancer or indeed who have heart attacks or who suffer from other smoking-related conditions. There are proposals that drinkers, that heavy drinkers, should be, should again not receive the same standard of care as non-drinkers. There are proposals that pregnant women should not be allowed to smoke on the grounds that it increases the chance of birth defects. Until recently, it was not possible to enforce any of these restrictions. On the whole, it is still not possible to enforce them. But you, you can see that we are gradually moving into a world in which it will be possible to enforce these things. It will be possible for you to go to the hospital and to be diagnosed as suffering from lung cancer and for the medical specialist to call up your details and say, oh dear, I see that for the past 10 years you've been buying 800 Marlborough every week. Well, this being the case, I'm afraid we're not going to do much for you. You can't have an operation. We'll give you some painkillers, go away and die, and um, let this be a lesson to you not to smoke so much. Or they can call up the records to see how much alcohol you've been buying. Or a pregnant woman can go along to her antenatal clinic and uh, she, can be, she can be called aside and told, you've been smoking, you've been buying cigarettes. Look, it says so on your health records here. Um, what we're going to do is we'll take your baby away from you as soon as it's born to make sure that it's not damaged any further. None of these things is being done at the moment in England, but there is no technological reason why it should not be done, and there are rising demands for these things to be done, partly to save lives and partly to save money. And I have no doubt for the next five years they will be done. If you are watched, you are controlled. If you know that someone is watching you, you will change your behaviour. You don't need to be dragged into a police cell. You don't need to have the police burn cigarettes into your flesh. You do not need to be dragged off to a labour camp for re-education. All of these things are so early in middle 20th century. Nowadays, the authorities can control you simply by watching you. And that is what makes all of this surveillance technology so dangerous. You may regard yourselves as sovereign individuals. You may shrug and say, yeah, if they know that I'm buying cigarettes, let them know. I don't care. I've nothing to be ashamed of. I don't care. I must say that I'm not one of those people. I am worried by what the authorities know about me. And if I believe that I'm being watched, I do change my behaviour. If you have children, if you have a career, if you have expectations from the authorities of any kind, and you know that you are being watched or that you may or that you may be watched by the authorities, then you will change your behaviour. In the short term, universal state surveillance will produce a nation of rather worried people. We shall be nervously looking over our shoulders, wondering if there's a video camera watching us have a cigarette somewhere. In the longer term, as new generations come along, the knowledge that you are watched and therefore controlled will be internalised. People will simply take it for granted that there are certain things they cannot do. And what you will have is an increasingly obedient and an increasingly conformist society. As I said, there will be no laws against 
There will be no laws against joining the British National Party. There will be no laws against um, becoming a radical Muslim. There will be no laws against a man wearing lipstick in public. It, it's just that those laws will not be necessary because people will not think of doing these things. In the same way at the moment in England, there is no law against picking your nose in public and eating it. But very few people do that because they know that they will be that people will think less of them for it. And this is the kind of society into which we are moving. In which being an individual will be much the same as picking your nose and eating it at a bus stop. Something that you simply do not do because the consequences will be inconvenient. And so all of this surveillance technology is dangerous. However, I could have given this speech 20 years ago. In fact, I did give something very like this speech 20 years ago. I do assure you, I said back in 1993, 22 years ago now, I do assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that we are moving into a high-technology police state in which your every move will be watched and recorded and in which, little by little, every ounce of individuality will be sucked out of you. That's what I said 22 years ago. And the thing is that, I, that there is very little evidence that I was right. I, I have seen little evidence for this high-technology police state. Oh, I mean, it exists. The government wants it. The government is watching us. But has it made us... Ha, has it made lesser individuals of us? Is there less dissidence today than there was 22 years ago? Do, do governments face less opposition and indeed less resistance than they faced 22 years ago? I think the answer is no. They don't face less. They face a great deal more. Another point I would make, especially in this country, is that um, police states... There have been police states for a very long time, and they have not always maintained themselves through mass murder, and they have not always had access to modern information technology. I am talking in Bratislava the capital of the Slovak Republic, or the second city in what used to be Czechoslovakia. Um, looking around the room, most of you were probably not born when communism collapsed, but your parents know enough about it. This was a very efficient police state for 40 years. It was a very efficient police state without a single hard disk or memory stick, without a single surveillance camera in public places, without a single high-tech identity card. It was all based on paper. And when I say that Czechoslovakia was a very effective police state, I measure its effectiveness partly by how long it lasted, 40, 41 or 42 years, I forget exactly. That's not bad and also by the relatively small numbers of people that the um, Czechoslovak police state murdered. I, I have always had some difficulty in finding out exactly how many people were murdered by communism in Czechoslovakia. The maximum number I've heard is 65,000, which I think is an exaggeration. I just don't believe anything like that number was killed. The smallest number I've heard is 300. I, I suspect the truth lies somewhere between those extremes, but rather closer to the 300. I, I, there was a terror in this country for the five years that Clement Gottwald ran it. Once he was dead and once Stalin was dead, um, the, the number of people arrested and beaten to death in police cells gradually tapered off until by the 1970s and 80s, the number of people murdered by the state became very small indeed. And so you had a police state 
which maintained itself without serious opposition and without having to resort after the first terror to mass murder. And it did this without computers. And so all of my paranoid fears about how technology will enslave us have not come true. And I should have known 22 years ago that they would not come true because you don't need all of this high technology to run a police state. What I would suggest is that although, although we do need to worry, although there are bad things which can happen and bad things which are happening at the moment, the overall effect of the information technology revolution has been to liberate us. It liberates us in all sorts of ways, and, and I won't um, go into detail about this. But what I will say in general is that in virtually all human societies, I'll mention a few exceptions in a moment, in virtually all human societies, it has been like a wheel. You have the outer rim of the wheel and the inner hub of the wheel. And the ordinary people have always been on the outer rim of the wheel, looking in towards the inner hub. We have no control over what is happening on the inside. We have little knowledge of what is happening on the inside. But people in that centre can look out at us, they can see who we are, what we're doing. They can give us just as much information as they please. And generally speaking, they can keep control. If we on the outer rim want to talk, we can talk among ourselves, we can talk to the people here and here and here. But if you want to talk to the people all around the wheel, the only way to do it is somehow to co-opt, somehow to make use of the central communications technology at the centre. Um, let me come away from the image. In about 1980, if you wanted to communicate with very large numbers of people, you had to buy advertising in the newspapers, or you had to try to persuade a newspaper editor to to publish your article or you had to send in a letter to the editor and hope it would be published or you had to hope that the television people would have you on to talk about whatever concerned you but that was about it as far as reaching a mass audience was concerned and obviously the people in charge of the television stations and the people in charge of the newspapers even if those were not owned by the state, were effectively part of the ruling class. And if you had a message which was not welcomed by the ruling class, never mind what it was, communism, fascism, libertarianism, vegetarianism, homosexuality, whatever they didn't like at the time for whatever reason, if they didn't want to listen to you, they would make sure that nobody else listened to you you were reduced to talking to the very small group of people that you already knew. And I'm old enough to remember how this was. When the Libertarian Alliance started in the late 1970s, we would meet at a hall in central London. Bear in mind that I'm talking about a free country. We didn't need to get permission from the police to run this meeting. We didn't need to. Because... We never had more than 20 people to these meetings, and they were always the same people. We'd advertise them in uh, little free newspapers. Libertarian Alliance meeting, Conway Hall, 13th of August, 1980. And the same 20 people would turn up and we'd sit around talking about the revolution that we were surely about to unleash on the world. And then we'd go home and have our lunch. But if you wanted to reach large numbers of people, you had to go to that central hub, the ruling class and the ruling class media. And if that ruling class media did not want people to know what you were saying, 
you weren't saying it. Now, of course, all of that is utterly transformed. You don't need you, you don't need the mass media. You don't need the newspapers. You don't need the mainstream television and radio stations. We have our own media. It's still early days. The Guardian website, I believe, has 60 million visitors a month. And I don't know how many visitors the Ines website and blog gets. Not as many as the Guardian newspaper. The Libertarian Alliance gets about 90,000 hits a month, which is respectable, but it doesn't compare with the 60 million that the Guardian gets. The BBC website probably gets even more than the Guardian. And if something happens anywhere in the world and you want to know the news about it, then yes. As a matter of course, you still go to, in my case, you go to the BBC. The revolution has not happened yet, but the revolution is happening. We are the media, and increasingly we are holding the authorities to account, and we are bypassing the state and central media to reach out to other people all over the world who may share our opinions, or who may be brought to share our opinions. And all of this has been made possible by the information technology revolution. All that computers have done, all that drones and surveillance cameras, and all of the other wonderful things that we now have, have done for the state, is to make it slightly easier and slightly cheaper to do things that states have always been doing. It makes a few things more possible than they were. I've mentioned the example of refusing people medical treatment because they're smoking. This is not something that could have been done in the past, and it's something that can be done now. This is bad, but I go back to my main point, which is that there have been police states of one kind or another as long as there have been human societies. All that information technology allows in the main is for states to be a little more efficient and a little cheaper to run. What it does for us, though, is it levels the playing field. It makes us the equal of the authorities. Let me, I'll finish in a moment because I'm sure there are many more interesting things that you have to say. But let me say this. The first Gulf War, 1990-1991, when, when the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, the only source of information I had about what was happening was the British mass media. In particular, the Daily Telegraph, which I read every day in those days. And what I was told by the Daily Telegraph was that when the Iraqis moved into Kuwait City, they went into a hospital and they ripped newborn babies out of incubators and dashed them to the floor so that they died and loaded the incubators up onto lorries to take back to Baghdad. I was assured that this was the case. And I saw photographs of the Kuwaiti nurse who had witnessed this with her own eyes and who testified before the American Congress what a terrible thing the Iraqi invasion had been. And because this was said in the Daily Telegraph and on the BBC and because it was echoed across the whole spectrum of the mass media, I never for a moment disbelieved it. It never struck me as possible that this might not be true. Six years later, in 1996, I picked up an old copy of a newspaper called Christian Science Monitor, which pointed out that the only evidence for this atrocity was given by a nurse, a Kuwaiti nurse to the American Congress, and that this Kuwaiti nurse was in fact not a nurse. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, 
She had no medical training and she had not been in Kuwait at the time of the invasion and she had been coached specially by a British public relations company called Hill and Knowlton. The entire story of the Kuwaiti babies taken from their incubators and killed was fabricated from beginning to end. I, I'm not saying that the, Kuwait, that the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was justified or particularly nice, but this was a lie. And as soon as I was able to check this on the internet, I did check it, and yes, this is what happened. Now, in 1990, what could I do? I could say, I don't believe this. I think this is war propaganda. Well, I could have said that. Some people did say that. But how do you prove it? How on earth do you prove it? Saying, I think this is war propaganda, I think it's lies, in 1990 was much the same as if I were to say now, I do believe that there is life on Mars. Well, there may be, but uh, what reason have I for saying that there is none whatever? By the time we came round to the Second Iraq War in 2003, 13 years later, the world had been utterly transformed. The American government, what was it, Colin Powell, the American Secretary of State, stood up before the United Nations and said, the British government has given me a dossier showing that the Iraqi government has weapons of mass destruction which it will be able to use against us within 45 minutes. This is clearly shown by this data gathered and published by the British government. And everybody said, oh, terrible things, weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. A Guardian journalist got hold of a copy of the British government's dossier and did exactly what I do when I'm marking a student's essay. It looked through it for a distinctive sentence and typed this into Google, surrounded by quotation marks. And it did this for other sentences. And within 45 minutes, yes, another 45 minutes, it was revealed that this British government dossier proving that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction was a pack of nonsense, a pack of lies. It had been some low-grade civil servant had been trawling the internet looking for one claim, another claim, another claim, drawing them all in together, mixing them up, and then saying this is the result of many years of careful investigation by the British security services that the dodgy dossier, as it was called, was revealed to be a pack of lies within 45 minutes of its publication. Unfortunately, the Second Iraq War still went ahead, and many hundreds of thousands of people have died as a result of that. But um, you can see, by these examples, what I'm saying. We live in a fundamentally different world. When I was given my diet of war propaganda back in 1990, I didn't like the idea of war, but I had no way of looking behind the propaganda. I had no way of telling whether any of this was true. Indeed, back in those days, I still had a fundamental belief that the British mass media was telling the truth. Oh, it might get some things wrong, individuals can be inefficient, individuals can lie. But the idea that all of the news directing me towards a war in the Middle East was just lies would have struck me as a conspiracy theory. Go away, I don't believe any of that stuff. By 2003, it was entirely different. And two years ago, the British and American governments tried to go to war in Syria didn't even get off the ground. Remember all the claims about how um, Assad was using gas against uh, the, the, the opposition? All the poison gas claims that turned out to be untrue? Remember all the claims about how the Syrian opposition 
were all democrats and secularists, people who wanted to turn Syria into a, a, another kind of Turkey. I remember those very well. And they fell down one by one. And we know now that although President Assad is not a very nice man, and I have not come here tonight to defend the Syrian government, the people who are doing their utmost to bring down the Syrian state and to involve us in a war to assist them uh, are the kind of people who like to chop heads off and burn people alive. Um, we know this. We can go behind the mass media. We can see the lies as they're being produced. And as I keep on saying, this means that we're living in a fundamentally different kind of society from in the past. It may have been slightly different in classical Athens where you had a very small physical space within which politics could take place, but it's certainly a new kind of society within our experience. None of this was possible, none of this would have been possible without modern information technology. And so, although we still need to have very strong concerns about the attack on electronic privacy being spearheaded by the British and American states, although we should not sit back and say, oh, I don't care if they know how I'm spending money online. Although we must keep a watch on these people and we must continue to protest, I think, on the whole, after 25 years or so of the information technology revolution, governments have lost and individuals have gained. 25 years ago, the government was here, we were there. Today, it's more like this. These people still know more things than we do. They still have certain advantages that we don't. But we have advantages that I and my friends back in 1978, when we set up the Libertarian Alliance, would not even have dreamed would be possible. We have a global audience, well, we have an audience of anyone who wants to listen to us, which may not be quite global, and we have the means of finding out the truth on any particular question. And sooner or later, this must have an effect. You cannot forever have a police state and a free media. We are moving towards a free state, but we have a free media. These two things cannot coexist in a stable bond indefinitely, and sooner or later one of these will break. And I suspect that it will be the police state that goes. I appreciate that many of you will know more about these issues than I do, and as I said, I wanted this to be more of a seminar than lecture. So that being said, I will sit down and thank you for your great indulgence in listening to me. Much more data 
actually, which, which can be definitely used even by the police, even, even by different authorities. And my own theory is that maybe later on in the, in the future, the police can, uh, can cope with this kind of commercial entities, which are collecting today all the data, and maybe can make a trade-off with them, you know. Mm. That they will not you know, monitor them properly because of the taxes or whatever, and those companies will give up a lot of data about about us, yes. what we are. Yes. Um, I agree with you. There is a danger. There is a danger that the vast mountains of data collected about us will eventually be gathered up and, and used in ways to enslave us. Yeah, I agree. But every generation, every single generation, we have faced threats of one kind or another of tyranny. 70, 80 years ago, we were worried, sorry, my country was worried for decades, right into the 1980s, that uh, there would be some kind of socialist takeover and we would end up like Czechoslovakia. And we were worried about we were worried about Soviet infiltration of the <coughs> trade union movement. We were worried about Soviet spying. We were worried about the very large uh, commercial navy that was being built by the Soviet Union. We were worried by all these things, but they passed away and we were not enslaved by them. And those people who were enslaved by the communists, well, communism itself died. Uh, but you see, we were worried in the 1960s in particular, we were very worried uh, about socialism. Just as in the 1930s we were very worried about fascism. Uh, and just as 200 years ago we were worried about the French radicals. Um, every generation we worry about threats to our freedom. And so, yeah, this is our reason to worry. And yes, we should worry about it because this time it may uh, do bad things. But on the other hand, it, it hasn't turned out that bad yet, has it? If I go onto Amazon as a reg if I tell Amazon, I'm Sean Gabb, I'm coming back to look, what does Amazon do? Does it come towards me saying, aha, you're in my web now, I'm going to oppress you and I I'm going to enslave you and steal from you? No, what Amazon does is to say, Dear Sean Gabb, based on your viewing and purchasing history, here are some books and CDs which we think you would like to buy. And sometimes I want to buy them. And if I go on to the Tesco website to buy things, Tesco knows what I've been buying. And it says, look, here is tuna fish, 20% off just for you today. If you want to call this oppression, if you want to call this slavery, well, give me more of it. But I do accept, I, no, I do accept that there is a problem. But we need also to bear in mind that although there is a problem, we are in a much better position today to make our feelings known to the authorities and to make our voices heard and to get what we want from the authorities than was the case 20 years ago. Indeed, um, if I could develop from that, I was involved a couple of years ago in a law suit, a legal action in England. Now, if you get involved in a law case and you don't have a lawyer, my wife and I didn't bother with a lawyer, in the past you were at an enormous disadvantage. You need to know what the law is. You, you need to have access to the Acts of Parliament. And Acts of Parliament are, well, they're not in every public library because there are half a million of them. They're in specialised law libraries. And an Act of Parliament is not made and then left alone by the British state. Oh, no. The Law of Property Act 1925 has been amended many, many times. There are amendments made every couple of years. And so you need to be able to find a law library 
which has all the Acts of Parliament updated and which has all the law cases updated and um, which is reasonably close to home because you may need to spend several hundred hours in that library. Well, those libraries exist. They're called the Internet. The British, I don't know about the Slovak state, but the British state has done a first-class job of making every single law available online for free. You can find every single Act of Parliament updated, every single statutory instrument, every single treaty, and increasingly you can find reported cases because there are a million of these, um, it, it is taking the British government a long time to get them online. But uh, to cut a long story short, I was able to go into court and to take on professional lawyers and to win. Because I was able to get the same sources of information as they had. Now, uh, this was not an action against the British state. This was just uh, an ordinary legal dispute between me and somebody else. But the somebody else was a very wealthy multinational corporation able to spend large amounts of money on lawyers. And in the old days, again, it was like that. Money buys you information. Money buys you legal advice. Money buys you access to the information. It was like that, and then it was now like that. And I took those people on, and I won. And the British state, as I said, has done a very good job of making all its laws online, getting virtually every document except those which are specifically classified online. And so if you want to know what's being said in Parliament, you can see it online. If you want to know... If you want to see the minutes of a local authority committee meeting, it's online. It has to be online. Uh, and all of these things are so very useful to us. There is a danger that the mass accumulation of data about our, about what we're doing and reading and how we're spending our money, there is a danger. But at the same time, we are able to find out exactly what the state is doing. We can find out the laws, and we can find out how the state is breaking those laws. Oh, and one more thing. If you were, 20 years ago, you're stopped by the police. I must say that my dealings with the police have always been very friendly. The police have always been very careful about me. But then, most police are not stupid. They look at someone like me, white, middle class, educated, trouble. You know, just um, be careful with him. But I, I know people who've had troubles with the police. And of course, they get you into the back of their car, they beat you up. They force you to sign confessions. They tell lies about you. All sorts of things. Um, they break into your house. They pull it apart looking for things, they say. And what can you do about that? Well, what you do about it now is you have a handheld video camera and you film them. Some countries try to make laws against doing this, but those laws are always deeply unpopular and they get struck down. Um, the police are watching you, but you can watch the police. And you see, the police have always been watching you. You haven't always been able to watch the police. That's the difference. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, if we imagine something like gout, like B meter with zero at the middle of the gout meter, and at the one end is a you know total state, totality state, and on the other side there is a libertarian utopia with its perhaps ruling and something like that. Maybe we are somewhere in the middle of that gap. Uh, what is your belief? Where we end up? 
Because there are two forces, like mm -hmm. in media that we were talking about, you can check that is pushing to the libertarian, and, and there is a police state that try to bring us to the totality. For example, what is your belief in the year 2100? Will be states in existence? Okay, let's say that here at zero is a libertarian utopia and here at 100 is something like North Korea. W where are we at the moment? I don't think we're at 50, I think we're at something like 15, maybe 20. I, uh, I turn up to meetings in England, I have coffee with friends in England and America and we work ourselves into a terrible state uh, about the police state that we are assembling and all the things that we done can be done against us and everything else. But, as I keep on saying, governments have always done bad things to people. It's just in the past they could do it in the dark. And there is now a universal glare of publicity surrounding the actions of the British, American and European states. Oh, if, if I were if, if I were giving this talk in, let me think of a country, Nigeria, maybe Nigeria, or if I were giving this talk in Thailand or in um, Ecuador, let's say, it might be more depressing, but then those countries tend to be rather more depressing whatever the state of technology. But I'm talking in Central Europe. I'm talking in Europe, in the European Union. And how exactly are we oppressed at the moment? We have to pay our taxes, don't we? You can't avoid that. That is your main point of interaction with the state. And if you do not pay your taxes, or if you do not pay something like your lawful taxes, you will get into trouble. But that is a fact of life. I wish it were otherwise, but it's always been that way. But how many people get put in prison in Europe for speaking their minds? There are laws in this country that prevent you from saying and even from reading certain things. Now, there are laws in this country that try to prevent you from saying certain things and reading certain things. And those laws, now and again, are used against an unlucky individual. But for the most part, they are unenforced. There are laws, the money laundering laws, which try to keep track of how you're spending your money. I don't know what the law is in Slovakia, but in England, if I want to take out more than £15,000 in cash from a bank account, I need to tell the bank what I'm planning to do with the money. If I want to pay in more than, I think, £10,000, <coughs> I must explain to the bank where I got the money. That is the theory. The practice, I know, is that the banks just do not usually apply these laws. Oh, if I have a black face and mirror lens sunglasses and um, I'm smoking cannabis and I'm in a place like Brixton and well, if I look like a drug dealer and I walk into a bank with £20,000 in used 20s, yes, probably the bank will say, where did you get this? And a report will be made to the Bank of England, and you may be investigated by the National Criminal Intelligence Service. But if you or I go into a bank and put in £50,000 in cash, nothing will be done. If a report is made to the Bank of England, nothing will be done about it. There are limited budgets. In England, the entire state security budget is absorbed into spying 
on teenagers with brown faces in places like Rotherham and Bradford trying to work out if they're going to blow themselves up in Starbucks. I'm under no surveillance whatever, none that I'm aware of. There are laws against smoking cannabis. I don't know about Slovakia, but in England those laws are not enforced. There are laws against the possession and sale of a whole range of recreational substances. Sometimes those laws are enforced. If they are enforced, you're very stupid or perhaps just unlucky. For the most part, the laws are not enforced. You can do pretty well anything you like in England, and you can do pretty well anything you like, I suspect, here in Slovakia. The only thing you can't do is stop paying your taxes. Beyond that, you are freer than your parents, which is not saying very much, but you're freer than your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents. A whole burden of state power dumped on the backs of our ancestors has been lifted. And we are complaining the whole time about how enslaved we are. We're not at 50% on your scale. At the worst, we're at 15, and it may be lower. Maybe, what's your opinion on decentralized cryptocurrencies? Do you think Bitcoin will be widely adopted at some time? I don't think Bitcoin will be widely adopted because it does not... It is an answer... It, sorry, it is a solution to a problem which does not really exist. The money that we have is safe enough for most purposes. It is possible that the authorities are watching you, but it is almost certainly the case that the authorities are not watching you. It w if you have a strong interest in child pornography, probably you'll get into trouble if you buy images or films using a credit card online. Probably. There's no certainty in that. It's just probably the case. Because the authorities are slightly worried about this. But for virtually anything else, you can do whatever you like. They will gather the data, great mountains of data, It'll fill millions of hard disks, or, 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 or big hard disks will need to be specially designed to house this data. And it will, never be, it will never be used, because it is beyond the ability of people to pay attention to it. When, when the World Trade Center was bombed in 2001, quite a long time ago now, but when the World Trade Center was bombed in 2001, the, the people behind it coordinated their plans on the internet. They used Hotmail. All of their communications had been swept up by the, by the American state security services. But it didn't matter because no one was reading them. But what, what if you look at the problem from the other side? Like it's not like the uh, you are a common citizen and uh, someone is waiting for for your mistake or for or you are not a problem maker or something. But you gather uh, individuals of interest and some trouble makers, and then it is much easier to gather the data on them. And you get every data you can imagine on those people, and, and the, the government can use the data against this person. Yes. Let me give you a depressing answer. If the authorities want to destroy you, they will destroy you. And if they can't find the date, if they can't find the evidence, they'll make the evidence. That's how it's always been. And so, no change. Yes, of course. Perhaps it's easier, and they can use the other Um, 
I have a prof- I've had some professional involvement with um, w- with um, it, miscarriages of justice. They're called in England, where the police have arrested the wrong man, and where he's been found guilty and spent many years in prison f- for a crime he didn't commit. In most of these cases, the authorities believed he was guilty. They couldn't find the evidence they needed to put him in prison, so they just made the evidence. And sometimes the authorities were right and sometimes they were wrong. Uh, and I just, I, I don't believe that there is any fundamental change. If the authorities can gather up all the evidence about you and use it to destroy you, that is sad. But 20 years ago, if the Slovak government had decided to destroy you, it would simply have... It would simply have fabricated something. It would have arrested you and said that you were drunk while driving. It would have claimed that you had raped a a four-year-old child or something. It would have used the Slovak media to put this out. No one would have doubted it. You'd have gone to prison. You'd have got out after a few years and that would have been it. No great change. The authorities have always been able to do this sort of thing. The difference is that we can challenge it. But let me go back to the um, mass accumulation of data. I don't know at the moment how many emails and texts are sent every day in the world. It's billions, maybe hundreds of billions, I just don't know. The figures, the the, the numbers look like telephone numbers and I, I stop taking them in. And all of these emails and text messages in hundreds of different languages are sucked onto giant computers maintained by the American and British governments. It's called Echelon, I believe. And you can use software tools to go through these looking for, uh, looking for keywords like Semtex, Jihad, Queen Elizabeth or something and you might narrow these billions upon billions of gigabytes of data down to something rather smaller but th- there comes a point where you can no longer use software to, um, t- to mine this data you need to use intelligent human beings intelligent human beings not just ordinary human beings intelligent human beings who will look through this and say this is a threat this is not a threat this is a waste of our time and there are just not that many intelligent human beings employed by state intelligence services to look through this data there are not even that many human beings who can be employed to look through this stuff they are gathering mountains of information which they simply cannot use. And by the time they have the tools to use it, we'll be dead. And by the time they have tools to find out what our children, our children's children are doing, they'll be dead. I I do suspect that if you... Okay... Stop thinking at the moment as libertarians. Stop thinking as people outside the state apparatus. If you continually look inward at these people with their giant budgets and their alarming legal powers, you'll be depressed. Put yourself in their position, looking out at us. They don't know who, they don't know who we are. They don't know what we're doing they have this great wash of data, endless information coming in and they don't know what to do with it. They have laws but they don't know which laws to enforce. They don't know which laws to enforce in which order. And they know above all else that they're being watched. They are being watched. Everything they do is open to inspection by us. Maybe not now, but will be open to inspection in the future. Yes. Uh, my name is Adam. I have to say that I like this discussion. 
Um, I have a few points of view that I like to present, and I like to hear what the others, maybe you, mm -hmm. think about them. Uh, in the first place, uh, we were talking about you know, uh, let's say big data, um, huge amounts of, amounts of data that are you know uh, just collected and used somehow. Uh, we were talking about the. I would say concrete use of the data. Like mm -hmm. we are trying to find someone who is you know, breaking the law, who is doing yes. something that we don't want him to do and stuff. But uh, I can see that this kind of data collected uh, can be used not to uh, you know, just punish some individuals on, or something like that, but I think that this kind of data, they can be used to, um, to guess the, the state of the society. Know, they just what do people think? What is the majority of you know uh, thoughts? What is uh, what is the percentage of, of uh, this kind of people? And what is the percentage of you know what? How many likes this kind mm. of article on the on the Facebook does and, and this kind of stuff? Mm. And uh, I would like to connect this with the thing you uh, you said previously, like for example uh, uh, when Colin Powell. Uh, Presented the, the data on based on yes. which they attacked another another uh, state. Yes. So uh, I think that from their point of view, it's not important what the public or what the uh, what the people will think about it in the future. Yes. It's important that it happened. They managed to attack with the, the state with the support of the uh, public. Because they were they were able to convince the public at least for a moment that this data we present you is the truth. So uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is that they have a they have a target destination and they are trying to get it. And uh, based on the data they have, they can guess what they should tell to the public and gain their you know trust or you know their support to get the thing done and after that they don't care what happens. They, they probably don't care that uh, people found out that it was a lie. You know, the, the, the uh, politicians will change, you know, everything will change, basically. I don't know. Uh, what do you think about this kind of... Well, let me... Because I'm older than you and because I was there and because I've seen it all, I'll tell you this. The British and American governments got away with the Iraq war in 2003 because this was the beginning, the dawn of the internet age. I, I had lunch with a friend in London and we were discussing the war before it started and he kept on saying, Sean, they must be telling the truth. They, they, they wouldn't tell lies so big. You know, they, they must be saying the truth. I just can't believe that they're lying. Um, and then it turned out they were lying. And don't think that the politicians in charge walked away from that. Tony Blair... Uh, Tony Blair has lived every day since he resigned as Prime Minister wondering if he'll be arrested and put on trial for war crimes. Um, the politicians involved in that war have all had their reputations destroyed. It, it, is normal, it is normal for a British Prime Minister to resign and to be put into the House of Lords. It is normal for a British Prime Minister to resign and to spend the rest of his life as a respected elder statesman. Tony Blair is regarded as a leper, the, the kind of person who wandered around medieval Europe ringing a bell saying, unclean, unclean. The moment, if Tony Blair wants to be, if Tony Blair wants to be on a television programme, if he wants to be invited to some official event, nobody wants to be seen with him. The man is a leper. And all of the other politicians involved in that war. And the politicians, politicians are not just interested in power and money. They also want to be respected, and to be respected for the rest of their lives. 
And Tony Blair hasn't had that, and nor has any of the other politicians. George W. Bush, again, his career was destroyed, his reputation was destroyed by that war. And so two years ago, the British and American governments decided that we had to go to war in Syria. The American and British public said no. The war propaganda was shown to be lies, and the war didn't happen. We haven't been to war with Iran. We've made a deal with them instead. Now, I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but what I am saying is that we are living in a fundamentally different age from 20 years ago, and I don't think the authorities have any answer to this. I'll go back to the point I made earlier. Put yourself in their position. You can't take bribes as easily as you did in the past because it will get out onto the internet. You can't lie as easily as you used to because people will check the facts. They can do that. What, what is the public discourse on the state surveillance in Britain? I mean, is there any response, any feedback, some political discussions about the level of uh, accepted uh, state surveillance or something? Like on the market, you see the responses to the state mm. surveillance. You see uh, applications like Prima for encrypting texting, you yes. see Red Phone for encrypting phone calls, uh, you see Bitcoins for anonymous payments. Uh, so I'm wondering if something is going on in Britain, especially in the context of, uh, I don't know, NSA, yes. who, who, which enabled Barack Obama to read Angela Merkel's emails and the stuff. So if, if, if something like this resonated with the public discourse in Britain. Most people in England are not seriously worried about a British police state. However, state surveillance is bitterly unpopular. It's unpopular not because we're frightened that the authorities will come and murder us or drag us off to concentration camps. We're frightened for these reasons. I've got some statistics here. In 2007, the Department of Work and Pensions lost the personal details of 45,000 people claiming old age pension. Um, in 2007 as well, a London Education Authority lost the personal details of 160,000 children. HM Revenue and Customs, that is the tax collecting authority, lost the personal details of 25 million families who are claiming child benefit. The Driving Standards Agency lost the personal details of 3 million candidate drivers. Um, there, is a, there is a separate entry on Wikipedia called Data Losses by the British State. The, the, the British State is quite good at assembling data. It's very, it's very bad at keeping the data secret. Um, in, indeed, a lot of the data collected by the British State is sent off to foreign countries for processing, places like Israel and um, South Korea, because it's cheaper. And there are concerns that this data is being used by the governments of those countries um, to hunt down and to murder their opponents. But even apart from that, there are stories almost every week in the British media of a civil servant who has gone to a strip club and has managed to lose a memory stick containing the details of three and a half million um, children under the age of five. They're always losing data. And so when the authorities say, oh, we want the details of your online purchases, the, the, the mass opposition is not from people saying, 
you're going to use this to put us into concentration camps in 20 years' time, aren't you? No. The mass opposition is from people saying, you're going to lose this. This information is going to get into the hands of God knows whom. No, you're not having that information. I do not want anyone except Tesco's to know how much dog food I'm buying. If the authorities find this out, they will lose it. That, that's the, that is the main discourse. And I think that is more like, uh, that's likely to be much more successful in terms of resistance than a straightforward libertarian argument. Because I am not myself convinced that the information being gathered can be used against us in quite the ways that I once believed. There is a danger. All information gives power, can give power. And so it's not a good idea for the British state to have access to our e emails, access to our text messages, access to our telephone records. It's a bad idea. But the, the, the main opposition in England is that the British state will just lose these and they will all end up in the hands of criminals. And what is your personal defense to state surveillance except for the uh, second identity of Richard by the confused government? Well, that is, um, that is an entirely valid way of defending yourself. Every time I, oh, I, I, have a, I have a great stack of loyalty cards, a loyalty card for Sainsbury, a loyalty card for Tesco, a loyalty card for Starbucks, a loyalty card for Shell, Petrol and so on. Um, every time I have dealings with a commercial organisation, it asks for information about me, name, address, date of birth, things like that. I always give slightly different information. And so uh, Facebook, my, if, you look on, if you look on my Facebook page, you'll notice that I was born on the 4th of August 1914, which is not true. Um, but the computers just accept that it's true. Now, now the, the, the purpose of this is so that if anybody ever does try to suck all of this information out of private databases, then there will be so many ghost um, entries, so many false doubles, that the information will be useless. I, ex I must exist under 20 or 30 different headings because I'm always giving slightly different ages, I'm always giving slightly different addresses. I sometimes spell my name in a different way. I reverse my names. Um, human beings would pick up on this immediately, but the data is not processed by human beings. It's processed by computers. You feed garbage into these computers, and garbage comes out at the end. So um, that is my personal response. Never give a straight answer to a question. Oh, if Starbucks wants to know where I live, well, actually, Starbucks has no need to know where I live, so I'll give a false address. I'll give the old address I had in the 1990s. Um, Starbucks has no reason to know how old I am. My doctor, he knows how old I am because it's important that he should. But Starbucks doesn't need to, so it gets a 1914 date of birth, or sometimes a 1901 date of birth, and I sometimes say that I'm a woman. Um, it, it doesn't matter. You confuse the databases. You tell the truth. You tell whatever truth you want to be known. As I said, if you are, if you are registering with a dentist, you tell your dentist how old you are. You also tell your dentist if you have a family history of diabetes or something, because all of this is relevant to making sure that you keep your teeth. If, on the other hand, you're filling in a Starbucks loyalty card, you just put any old nonsense in. They have no right to know these details, they, they, um, and it will do you no harm if they do have nonsense about you. That, that is the response. 
Oh, and uh, sorry, one more thing I would mention before I do finish. HSBC, I believe, maintains most of its customer records on a computer system which was developed in the late 1970s. And it is too expensive to transfer the records to something more modern. The system is permanently on the edge of breaking down. And there are many other banks in this country and in mine which are trapped with out-of-date software solutions. I don't think that governments are fundamentally different. A great deal of the information assembled by the British state in the 1990s is n can no longer be accessed because it's all on obsolete media uh, or it's, it's held in obsolete software systems. And I suspect that most of the information held about us today will be equally useless in five or ten years' time. You, you, you need to... There are threats to freedom. We need to be aware of them. And mass surveillance is a threat to freedom. But if you keep... If you try looking... If you try looking out from the state, if you put yourselves into their position and you look at the constraints they face, these threats are not as great as they seemed in the early days of the information technology revolution when I, for one, did not understand the nature of the new age we were entering. So, you know, drink up. It's not as bad as many people think it is. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh. So in, uh, let me thank to Sean Gap again for his wonderful lecture. <laughs> I would also like to thank you for uh, your kind attention and the discussion. And uh, if you are interested in issues like this, please follow our Facebook or our website. We uh, are planning to organize interesting events during the following months. So maybe we will see each other there. So thank you again and have a nice evening. <laughs>